Project Pinky in Color. Starring Nick Blackhurst. Also starring Richard Brunning. And Rex Hamilton as Abraham Lincoln. Tonight's episode, The Unruly Barnet. Coming up in episode 32, I have to make sense of all this lot while Nick puts his feet up for a change. And our very expensive bin finally succumbs to the sheer weight of crap in it. At the end of the previous episode, we'd ported, polished and modified the inlet manifold. We'd rebuilt the gearbox and made it look pretty. Plus we installed and plumbed in the new Garrett safety turbo. But we're not quite finished with the engine yet. At the moment it's neither use nor ornament because this engine needs more than a fancy turbo and some shiny bolts to make it work. So once again it's down to me to do the important bit which is to connect it to the car's nervous system. Which is just another way of saying it's time for some more wiring. Only it's not. Because it's pretty much impossible to build an engine loom when everything I need to wire to is, shall we say, conspicuous by its absence? By my reckoning, there are 11 sensors missing off the engine that I need to wire to, and for the most part, it's as easy as just screwing them back into the hole from whence they came. Things like these water temperature sensors are easy. One is for the signal to the ECU, and the other one is for the water temperature gauge. Happily, Toyota gave us plenty of scope for multiple sensors on this original water manifold. It is pure coincidence that when perfectly tight, this sensor has the plug lined up horizontally, because the alternative means that someone would have had to add enough liquid PTFE around the tapered threads to make sure of it. The sensor for our analogue temperature gauge gets the spanner treatment too. With those installed, it leaves us with some holes to bung up in the water manifold, starting with this little one at the bottom. Then there's a big one at the top. I don't know why there are so many ports on this thing, seems a bit overkill to me. And finally, the hole at the front is bunged up. Nice. Hold on, what's going on here? Of course. It's got to be vertical, hasn't it? Loony. Next up is the oil pressure transducer, again for the ECU, and also the low oil pressure light switch, which both want to live here in the OEM location because that's the point furthest away from the oil pump. To accommodate both, we have a T-piece. The transducer is quite bulky, so it goes alongside the engine, while the switch, well, it just gets screwed into the end. Knock sensor next, and we've gone for a Bosch donut type with an 8mm hole. But of course, the hole in the block assigned for it is M12 by 1.25. Brilliant. It was necessary to whip up a little adapter to reduce the thread in the block down to M8. The knock sensor is basically a little microphone that detects detonation or knock, which occurs when the mixture inside the cylinders is too lean. Detonation can quickly destroy an engine, so this sensor is really important. This bulky thing is the sender for our analogue oil pressure gauge. It needs to go on here. The boss made up for the turbo oil field line, but it won't because it's way too big. So we've bunged up the end of another T-piece and the sender is going to screw into that instead. We figured having the oil pressure gauge's signal from this location, just before the turbo, would alert us to any problem with the oil feed to it and give us the opportunity to quickly take action to avoid any damage. It's not the easiest of places to access, but Nick's nimble fingers get the job done, and then it's tightened up by a spanner. Last on the list of easy peasy stuff is this inlet air temperature sensor, which just gets bolted into the boss we made when modifying the inlet manifold. I think that's it for the straight screw on stuff. You'd think we'd be able to just bolt on this crank angle sensor, wouldn't you? 
Well, sadly not, because the 3S engine takes its crank position from inside the dizzy, and it doesn't like that because reasons. So we've got to mount a trigger wheel to the front pulley and find somewhere to house the sensor too. Way back when, when God's dog was a pup, Nick machined up the front pulley that drives the alternator and AC pump system. And while he was doing that, he included a step the same thickness as the trigger wheel. So to fit it, we need to bore out the center of the trigger wheel to the same dimension as the outside diameter of the step. Then three holes are marked out and drilled through both parts. Without the trigger wheel in the way, the holes in the pulley are drilled a little deeper before all three are tapped to M5. We're going to be using countersunk screws to hold the wheel in place, so the holes need a jolly good countersinking. The fasteners get a little dab of Loctite before being tightened down, and that's the trigger wheel assembly complete. The next job is to whack it back on the lathe to true it all up and make sure there's no run out, as the sensor needs to be very close, so we can't have any wobble. There's no wobble there, that looks to be running beautifully. The last job before painting it is to remove one of the 24 teeth. At the moment, the sensor will pick up a signal every 15 degrees of crank rotation. But by removing this tooth, which is at 90 degrees before top dead center on cylinder one, the ECU will recognize this gap or trigger, which it needs in order to be able to tell where the engine is in its rotation. The 90 degrees before TDC is our choice, could be any of the teeth, but you've got to start the ignition timing somewhere. Time for some paint. Sweet. This was balanced along with the crank, flywheel and clutch, so now it can be bolted to the engine so we can try and figure out where to mount the sensor. It can't go above because of the auxiliary drive belt and the chassis rail. It can't go in front because of the exhaust. It can't go underneath because of the sump. So the only place it can go is behind in this area, which is close to the drive shaft, but it's all we've got. Of course, what we need now is a bracket. <laughs> We've removed two of the bolts that hold the oil pump housing on, and the new bracket is bolting on there, as there was no other handy locations to fix it. But with the two bolts nipped up, the crank angle sensor can go in. The face of the sensor needs to be very close to the teeth for reliable and repeatable results, so a feeler gauge is used to set it all up before everything is tightened down properly. The gap is set to roughly half a mil, or 20 thou if you're that way inclined. Here you can clearly see the gap in the teeth that will become one of the triggers for the ignition timing. And of course the trigger wheel is smack bang in the centre of the sensor. That's one tricky little job done, on to the next. The speedo sensor. <laughs> 
But I hear you cry, it fits in that hole down there and nothing could be simpler. Well, yes and no. You see, we pushed the engine so far back in relation to where it was in the Celica that even with no plug on the top, the plastic housing clouts the underside of the steering rack. So we've got to do something about that. I wasn't expecting him to take it to the sander, but there you go. The idea here, I think, is to shorten the housing enough to clear the steering rack and then attach a fly lead to each of the three terminals and then pop the cavity, making it impervious to water and vibration. The fly leads will then go to a new connector mounted somewhere we actually have room for it. Not that we have much room for anything, in fairness, but that's not my problem. We've done very little soldering on this project, thankfully, but here we can't help it, as the crimp terminals stick out past the top of the plastic housing. So Nick's cut them off and whipped out the soldering iron to attach the wires in a low-profile styly. The heat shrink is almost certainly superfluous given we're potting the whole thing, but they're all done now and we're ready to release the schmoo. That should keep the smoke in and the dust and everything else out. Once smoothed off with a wet finger, it sets and then the speedo sensor can be installed into the gearbox. We'll find a place to put the new connector in a bit, probably somewhere under the dizzy I would imagine. And talking of the distributor, that's next on the list of things to get sorted. Distributors like this one from our engine are old hat now, so even if we could fit it, and we don't have room, we wouldn't. What we do need though, is a cam trigger to sync up with the crank trigger we fitted earlier. So we're going to retain the drive peg, the o-ring oil seal and the backing plate, but junk the shoddy old electronics inside and the bulky distributor cap. The whole thing needs disassembling and some new bits need fabricating to make it work like we want it to. So while Nick gets on with that, I'm going to get the funk out. After a visit from Halfraud's finest satin black rattle can, the new cap is looking good. It can now get screwed onto the old distributor housing containing the new trigger wheel. Just one trigger on this one, so the ECU can sync up with the crank trigger and tell exactly where the engine is in its cycle. 
This allows us to use fully sequential ignition and injection and gives us the most precise control over the engine parameters. You can see the trigger on there, through the hole where the sensor is going. This is exactly the same type of Hall effect sensor that we're using on the crank trigger. It's got an O-ring to keep out any crud and it's held in by one M6 screw. That, I have to say, is a nice job. If you ever need to test any of these two-wire magnetic pickups, just hook it up to the AC side of a multimeter and give it a spin, and it should register a very small voltage. Cool. Let's whack it on the engine. By using the old distributor mounting plate, the slotted hole gives us about 15 degrees of movement if we need to change the position of the cam trigger in relation to the crank while we're sinking it all for the first time, which is nice. We've set the adjustment in the middle for now, and that's the last of the sensors sorted. But that's not the end of it. What I need now is a haircut, but I'll settle for some injectors, which should have been fairly straightforward. But if you haven't already, pull up a chair, because therein lies a tale. A long time ago, and in an effort to try and stop things getting too safe on the dyno, I acquired a set of these ID1000 injectors. These were the thing to have at the time, and perfect for my needs, right up until later in the build, when the only bolt-on fuel rail we could find doesn't actually fit them. No, we wouldn't have had this problem had we have just bought an off-the-shelf kit, but way back then, we just couldn't find one. The fuel rail came with these little adapters for the 3S head, and it all fits fine, except for the injector hat being too small for the fuel rail. A simple enough problem to sort out, so my colleague went off on a quest to find me a set of adapters with a bigger O-ring, which, in fairness, he did. It's just they're attached to a set of ID1050Xs. Other than the sharp pain to my wallet, this is good news. These are the latest injector tech and a direct catalogue replacement for our old 1000s, so they should be perfect. Only they're not. The overall length is exactly the same, which is great, only they've moved the bloody plug down the body of the injector closer to the tip, and that's caused much angst and gnashing of teeth, because now they won't clear the rocker cover and consequently don't fit. First thing we need to do to get these ID1050Xs to fit is junk these adapters and whip up some new ones. We need to push the injectors away from the head, so some longer adapters are needed. Thankfully, we have a lathe and some bar stock, and we both love turning. So while very frustrating to have our bolt-on stuff not bolt-on at all, it's not the end of the world to spend some time with the MIFID. It might be tempting for you to think that by pushing the injector away from the inlet tract, we run the risk of the spray pattern colliding with the walls of the adapter. But no, we worked it out, and we're well within the 34mm safe zone. So there's our four shiny new adapters ready to be fitted. You can see we've added about 15 mil compared with the one supplied with the fuel rail. A smear of lube always makes insertion that a little bit easier, and now the adapter can be pressed into the head. These are a very light interference fit, but to get them to seat properly, it was prudent while at the lathe to make an adapter hammer interface to avoid damaging the new parts with the twatting stick. The new injector fits nicely in the adapter, so that's great, but like everything on the car, it's still very tight indeed. The next problem is that now the whole assembly is too long by the 15mm we just added, but it occurred to us that the ID of the 11mm and 14mm injector hats was identical, it was just the thickness and the OD of the O-ring that was different. It's only money. So out comes the little fuel filter from the shorter, older hats. A smashing little fixture was created to hold them in the chuck while we extended the O-ring land to take the bigger 14mm version. The ID1050Xs are available in different lengths and O-ring sizes, but 
These were the ones listed for the 3S GTE. And anyway, the injector body is exactly the same. The only differences are in these top hats. So we've grafted the old hats onto the new injectors and they fit the fuel rail just fine. Time to bolt on the supplied brackets and give our new assembly a whirl. That's right, I did say supplied brackets. Nick hasn't had to make these. After all, this lot just bolts on, remember? Only, of course, it doesn't. The brackets are not long enough now. Brilliant. Never fear, spacers are here. Hot off the lathe and ready for action. Now, with a bit of luck, the test fit will be perfect. We can assemble the whole thing, call it done and forget about it for now. Woohoo! Oh. Bollocks. Now the rail is too low and although it doesn't look like much, the misalignment of the injector and the adapter means that half of our fuel stream will now hit the roof of the intake port. Now we could remake the bracket, but ain't nobody got time for that, so we've whipped up a couple of spacers to raise up the fuel rail and straighten out the injector. These threads are some tricky indeterminate yank spec size, so we've tapped them out to a good old British M5 so we can use longer screws. That has done the trick and it's square in the adapter now. Best just try the connector before we go any further. Yep, that's good too. Sorted. The obsolete, manky old side feed injectors and rail are now scrap and have been replaced, after quite a lot of faff, by a set of ID1050X top feed injectors and a billet fuel rail. This is a significant upgrade. Those that have been following along closely may well be thinking that we could have just put a bigger o-ring on our original ID1000s and saved myself an awful lot of time and money. Well, yes, and shush. Our fuel feed is going to connect to this end of the rail, so what we need now is to get from this end of the rail to our return and somewhere along the line incorporate a fuel pressure regulator. This is your common garden OEM style fuel pressure regulator, which we don't have to use. Because we've got this. This fuel lab in tank power module flows a whopping 105 gallons per hour. Here it is installed in our fuel tank before the end was welded on. The pickup is right at the bottom in the sort of swirl pot area. The only problem with one big pump like this is that even when you're not trying to safely overtake a tractor, it's still running flat out all the time, drawing lots of power causing the fuel to heat up and creating a huge amount of noise. Had we had the room, we could have used multiple pumps and staged them in the ECU according to demand. Well, we can do that much more elegantly with this Prodigy electronic unit when we combine it with this. This electronic fuel pressure regulator has regular Dash 6 AN ports. It has a normal mechanical base pressure setup on the top. It has standard boost reference port as you'd expect. But then at the bottom, it has this little four pin plug, which is connected to some electronic wizardry inside that can detect changes in demand. It will instantly vary the flow accordingly by sending a signal back to our in tank pump. It's a clever bit of kit. And I think you'll agree an improvement over the standard OEM style regulator. So where do you think we've got space for this? Touche. You're always finding something to whinge about. I mean, it's just a case of finding a piece of real estate close to the fuel rail that isn't already occupied by something else, creating somewhere new and exciting to bolt the bracket to, using an old bit of aluminium, the drill, an M6 tap, and the TIG welder, junking the supplied bracket because no one at Fuel Lab ever thought their regulator would be used in something less capacious than an elephant scrotum, make our own more suitable bracket that picks up on the new boss on the side of the inlet manifold, I mean, this is all bread and butter stuff. Apart from the fact that, yes, the new regulator is a teeny bit bigger than your normal style, and I'll admit we have almost no room available in the engine bay, and okay, actually doing any of the fittings up in situ is going to be nigh on impossible, but seriously, I just don't know what he's worrying about. The new bracket is done and screwed on and the boost reference fitting is now added before finally the all important cable is fitted. 
To get the fuel from the rail to the regulator, we once again raided competition supplies for this stainless steel braided hose and sexy black fittings. And after bolting the regulator onto the inlet manifold, the new hose is installed. And now you know why we didn't just ditch the caps and put the injector straight in the rail. Yep, while the injectors would have fitted into the fuel rail without the blue top hats, it would have been too close to the head and this 180 degree fitting would not have cleared the cam pulley backing plate. Hmm. He couldn't resist yet another bracket to support the fuel hose. He's incorrigible. The final touch is the 90 degree fittings that will eventually get made into hoses for the feed and return links to the bulkhead. And that's the fuel system sorted. Now it's time to move on to the ignition. As we've repurposed Toyota solution, we've got to find another way to fire the spark plugs. This wasted spark coil pack was the manufacturer's upgrade to the distributor. The DIS or distributorless ignition system offered many benefits over its predecessor. It was basically maintenance free and was managed by the ECU allowing much better control over the ignition timing. This one is a Ford system we were using on the rally car. Now that would work perfectly well but we've already put the time into the cam trigger so we're going to go one step further and use coil on plug with these Toyota Yaris coils. There's one of these coils for every spark plug, so as well as offering even more control over the timing than the wasted spark system, we don't need to find a place to put the bulky coil pack, and there's no unsightly plug leads. We've chosen these Yaris coils because they are reliable, available, and for reasons that will become apparent, they don't stick prior to the rocker cover as much as, say, the R35 coils. And these ones have a plug that's horizontal. Plus, they're a very common upgrade for the 3S engine. They actually fit in there quite nicely. All that we've got to do now is find a way to keep them there. You might be thinking that you can just buy adaptive plates like this, so why go to the trouble of making one? Well, yes you can, but our application has a very specific set of requirements that preclude us from using an off-the-shelf part. Like most things on this build, you have to look at this holistically and not as an assembly of individual parts. And anyway, it's done now, so that's great. Well, after all that, I think that's nearly everything ready for me to wire to, with just one glaring omission. That's right, the wideband oxygen sensor is vital, so it would have been remiss of us to forget that. And now, I can finally get on with the wiring. But where to start? Well, the engine loom is really just an extension of wiring that's already been done, so it made sense to me to start with where they join. And to help me with that, I made these pinout diagrams of how the body side plugs were wired. You might remember these from an earlier episode. What I've got to do is mirror the pin out for the engine side of the loom and connect the other end of the wires to their respective components. We got the 2.5 metre loom from Link, thinking we'll never use over 8 feet of wire in a 10 foot long car. But we couldn't have been more wrong, 
And to get another pair of looms, so here I am stripping out all the wires I need from the new ones. I'm taking that as a lesson learned, because the longer 5 meter loom is much better value than two shorter ones. Never mind, it's only money. Once I'd identified all the wires that I need, the next job was to strip and crimp on all the terminals. Then it's just a case of pushing all the wires into the right locations in the connector. The two looms now have the requisite number of wires, and we can now start the job of protecting them. Heat shrink on first to keep it all together nicely, and then we're using some anti-abrasion nylon sheathing, textured for extra sensation. I've amalgamated the two separate looms, and a final bit of sheathing and heat shrink means they're now ready to offer up to the engine. I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm thinking I don't know precisely where these plugs go in relation to the engine. But happily, this bracket does. Yep, before we took the engine out, we made a fixture that precisely replicates the position of the connector bracket, then the car is bolted to the strut tower. This means I can confidently wire to each of the components knowing that the connectors won't be in a different place once the whole thing goes back in the car. The dummy body side connector halves allow us to do the plugs up properly, making sure they stay put for the duration of the loom construction. Not exactly secure though, is it? You happy with that, are you? Turns out, no, he wasn't. So while I put the kettle on for a well-deserved brew, Captain Caveman whips out his favourite tools to begin the building of some sort of aluminium tray to house the wiring loom in. We're planning to split the harness in a number of directions once it spans the chasm of doom and reaches the relative safety of the engine. It's no good having it waving in the wind, so this tray will support the angry pixies in their perilous journey across the void. A suitable hole to screw it to on this end did not present itself, so one had to be created. On the engine side, one of the cam cap bolts makes a fine fixing point. Well that's terrific, a lovely new tray to sit the harness in with zip tie points to keep it all contained. Shame it hasn't got a lid I suppose. Ugh, should have kept my mouth shut, it's going to be another 5 minutes before I can actually start the bloody wiring. Still. It keeps him out of mischief, even if for a short while. I'm not entirely convinced a carbide burr is the correct tool for this job, but I'm loath to interrupt him at this point. And there you have it. One tray and cover ready to accept the wiring harness. But his cable management odyssey didn't stop there. Nope, he made one for the top of the fuel rail. This one with grommets and everything. This one will house the wiring for the injectors, the O2 sensor, the fuel pressure regulator and stuff, the list goes on. While he was at it, he also made this little tab for holding down the speed sensor wiring. Oh yeah, and all of these little brackets with zip tie points to make sure the cable runs are neat and tidy. I've told you before, mental. Anyway, back to the important stuff, i.e. me. I've laid out the loom in the tray, and now with the flush cutters, you don't see those very often, I can make sure it doesn't move while I'm sorting the rest of it. I've split the loom off into branches grouped together by rough location. So, now instead of dealing with one massive nightmarish bunch of wires, I have multiple massive nightmarish bunches of wires. Now I've got all these wires that need to go to the throttle, but nowhere to plug them into this carburetor. That's because carburetors have absolutely no business being on this engine. It was a joke. But that's not to say that carburetors don't have their place. Oh, I can see the comments now. There's nothing wrong with the carbon, Dizzy. They've worked perfectly well for years. Well, yes, but the same could be said of a CRT screen and dial-up. But I'm guessing that's not how you're watching this now, is it? We've gone for a custom-made billet aluminium 74mm shaftless fly-by-wire electronic throttle body from AT Power. It's very NASA. And it should be perfect for helping us overtake all those massive Fergusons you see around here. No, it won't be laggy, and no, it won't be unreliable. What it will be is fully programmable, which allows us to control many things, which we'll show you once it's back in the car. <laughs> 
The throttle body, like the O2 sensor, has fly leads already installed, so I'm bringing them to a sealed plug to connect it to the loom. Eight wires for the throttle body alone. Eight wires! That's almost 12 wires! I've finished wiring that, and now I can plug it in. Along with the O2 sensor, and the inlet air temperature sensor. We won't bore you with the rest of it. Suffice to say, it was tedious, but necessary. Well, that leaves us with this not very big area on the top for a charge cooler. Luckily, they come in all different shapes and sizes off the shelf, none of which are any good to us. What we did find, however, was a 40 mil thick aluminium radiator from a Mini. Time for Nick to do his thang. After a little tart up with some powder coating, the new water to air heat exchanger looks terrific. The air compressed and heated by the turbocharger will pass through the matrix inside and be cooled by the water circulating within. We've added fill and bleed points on the very top because to get at the spark plugs, or indeed almost anything on the engine, the charge cooler has to come off. There's also a monster tile dump valve for the very best whooshing noises as you come off the throttle. The water feed and return to the radiator at the front run down either side of the engine and we'll show you those come final assembly. The charge cooler has a very specific order to its assembly because there was no design freedom at all to get it within the confines of the Mini's engine bay. Once the silicon couplers are fitted, Nick can gently and carefully wiggle the charge cooler into place. <laughs> 
A couple of beefy brackets were made for it to sit on, and it can now get bolted into place. The whole thing is sat on anti-vibration rubbers for extra protection. As you can see, every component is as close to every other component as it's possible to be without touching. Just. I mean, here you can see why we had to make our own coil plate. The charge cooler barely clears the top of the coils. In fact, we'll probably remove the plastic lip on top of them just to be sure. So there you have it. The engine, transmission, subframes and suspension etc have all been completely refurbished and are ready to go back on the car. Nothing else for it I guess. See you next time for some paint. Tune in next time for another exciting episode from the files of Project Binky. Are you sure about this? It'd be the most accurate haircut you've ever had, mate. No, no, I mean, is it safe? Uh, as long as I set the Z-Eye correctly, you'll be fine. No, don't move.